Hey everyone, I'm Adam Harrington from Learn Your Land. I'm hanging out here at North Park in Western Pennsylvania. And because it's Valentine's Day, I thought I'd come out here and show my love and appreciation for the organisms that inhabit this area. And even though it is a holiday, it's still a great day to get out and to check in and see what's going on with the land. You know, if you ever decide to go on a walk with me in the woods, you will soon discover that we probably won't make it more than five, maybe 10 minutes, maybe even a few seconds without me blurting out some tree, mushroom, or plant species. It's just what I like to do. And in this video, it's gonna be no different. So because you hit the play button on this video, you're gonna come along with me. We're gonna take a brief walk around this area and just see what's going on in mid-February here in Western Pennsylvania. We're not gonna to go too far in depth with any one particular species, but we're just gonna use this as a way to improve our overall winter identification skills. But most importantly, we're gonna use this as a way to connect much more deeply to our land. Right off the bat, I'm greeted by an eastern white pine tree, or Pinus strobus. And this one's unique among the native pine trees here in Pennsylvania in that it's the only native pine tree that has fascicles or bundles of leaves or needles that are born in sets of five. So if you would count the individual leaves or needles in each bundle, you would see that there are five of them. And that's unique. That's an identifying feature for the eastern white pine tree. Now Pennsylvania, many centuries ago was covered by massive eastern white pine trees. However, most of them were cut down in the 1800s and in the early 1900s. A few pockets of massive pine trees still exist. You probably have to go up to Cook Forest State Park or Hearts Content. Down here in southwestern Pennsylvania and in North Park, most of it's new growth. You won't see too many very, very large eastern white pine trees. It's a very valuable species though, especially for the forager. So you can make teas or infusions out of these leaves or needles and you'd get some vitamin C that way. You'd get a lot more vitamin C making the same infusion out of the inner bark of this species. And then the pine pollen, which drops every May here in Pennsylvania, maybe the second or third week of May, is a very nutritious and medicinal substance. So this is the Eastern white pine tree. Let's keep going. Right here, we have one of the most invasive species in Pennsylvania. And you can tell it's invasive because it's covering completely this entire hillside and most of the area in this park. And this is Japanese barberry, or Berberis thunbergii. It was brought over in the 1800s as an ornamental, and it didn't take too long for it to establish a foothold. Now this is a deciduous spiny shrub, and it's got pale yellow flowers in the spring, and then it fruits later in the fall. And the fruits persist throughout the winter, so you can find them right now, and they are edible. They're longer than they are wide, and they are a bright to a dark red color. Now most of the magic actually is found in the root because the root contains one of the most powerful antibiotics in nature known as berberine. Now there's some research to suggest that Japanese barberry, not only is it invasive and it can crowd out some native plants, but it can act as a nursery for ticks. And my experiences cooperate this. And the researchers suggest that because the humidity can be increased underneath the canopy of this plant, the ticks like that so they don't desiccate or dry out. And whenever I'm walking through here in the summertime, yes, there are a lot of ticks in this area, probably because there's a lot of Japanese barberry. This time of year, it's very cold. It's about four degrees today, so I'm not too worried right now, but I probably wouldn't be doing this later in the year. Anyway, this is Japanese barberry, Berberis thunbergii. So I think I found the tiniest species that I'll probably identify today. This is a very teeny tiny mushroom or fungus. If you can see it right here, I mean, I'll zoom in, I'll show you some other pictures of it. But this is the split gill polypore, or Schizophyllum commune. And this is a fungus that can be found year round on deciduous sticks and logs, maybe sometimes stumps. And it's a very tiny mushroom with very fine hairs around the cap. It doesn't have a stem, but it's attached to the wood. And if you look on the underside, it looks like it has gills, but it's actually folds. And these folds are split, hence the name split gill polypore. This is considered an edible mushroom by some cultures around the world. And you could even find this in some medicinal mushroom formulas on the market. But again, this is a very tiny mushroom known as split gill polypore or schizophyllum commune. Okay, so I found another really tiny species. However, this one's a little more conspicuous than the split gill polypore. I actually talked about this one recently in another video. If you haven't seen it, I'll tell you a little bit about it. If you've already seen it, well, I'll refresh your memory. This is ceramic parchment, or Xylobulus frustulatus. It's a crust fungus that kind of resembles broken pieces of ceramic tile. It's a white rot fungus, so what it's doing is it's helping to break down this oak tree 
by breaking down the lignin and also the hemicellulose and the cellulose. These are plant cell wall compounds found in this oak tree. Without this fungus, this oak tree would have a difficult time getting that decomposition process started. It's a very common fungus found in oak dominated forests in North America. So you shouldn't have too much trouble finding it if you know where you're looking. Again, this is ceramic parchment or Xylobulus frustulatus, a white rot fungus that's breaking down this oak tree here. Well, it was only a matter of time before we came across this plant right here. This is another invasive plant, kind of like the invasive that we saw earlier, Japanese barberry. This one is Rosa multiflora, or the multiflora rose. This one was brought over in the 1800s from Asia as a rootstock for ornamental roses, and then promoted in the 1900s for its use in soil erosion control. Now in the springtime, it's got white flowers that eventually in the fall give way to these red fruits or red hips that persist throughout the winter. So you can kind of see them here and you can eat them throughout the winter months. They actually get sweeter as the year progresses. In the wintertime, they actually taste pretty good. Now, rose hips are a great source of vitamin C. This species right here has about 250 milligrams of vitamin C per 100 grams of tissue. That's about five times the amount gram for gram found in an orange. Not only that, rose hips contain another powerful compound known as lycopene. Lycopene is a red carotenoid pigment that we usually think of when we think of tomatoes or guava or watermelon or grapefruit. And lycopene has been studied for its antioxidant properties and anti-cancerous properties as well. So this is the multiflora rose or rosa multiflora. So I found three trees that I'd like to quickly identify for you. This one is a native tree known as the tulip poplar tree or the tulip tree or the American poplar tree. Liriodendron tulipifera. It's in the magnolia family. This one's unique and that's one of the tallest trees in the hardwood forest here in Pennsylvania. It's probably the tallest tree that I saw today. I did see a very large white oak tree earlier, but this one is a close second. What else is unique about this is it's, even though it's really tall, it doesn't really branch out until it's very high up in the air. Sometimes it won't branch out until it's about 80 to 100 feet in the air. So it's very tall, very straight, and very few branching down below. What else is unique about this tree? If you look up at the top, you can see a key identifying characteristic of this tree. And it, it is that there are dried fruit capsules or cones. They almost look like dried candles or flames at the top of this tree up in the canopy. And these are the dried fruits that release the Samaras in the fall. The Samaras are the seeds. They're kind of like those helicopter-like seeds that we think of when we think of maple trees. But this tree, the tulip poplar tree, drops those Samaras as well. And those cones are those candle-like fruit capsules they still persist, they still remain throughout the winter. So look up at the top of this tree, and if you see those, if you see a really tall tree, it's probably the tulip poplar tree. And if you're a mushroom hunter, come back to spots where you find tulip poplar trees, because there's an association between morel mushrooms and tulip poplar trees. But again, this is the tulip poplar tree, Liriodendron tulipifera. Right across from the tulip poplar tree, we have a member of the rose family. This is a black cherry tree, or Prunus serotina. And it's quite easy to identify just by looking at the bark pattern. The bark doesn't really look like other trees. The bark kind of looks like cracked or dried layered potato chips or corn flakes. You don't usually see this with other trees. This is a very interesting species because it is a pioneer species, meaning it's one of the first to come in and colonize damaged or disturbed areas. And it takes advantage of scarce resources. So Pennsylvania was clear cut in the 1800s. There's a lot of farmland. There's a lot of abandoned farmland. You usually see these cherry trees moving in, sometimes taking over areas completely. Now, this is an edible species. You can eat the fruits. However, they're a little smaller than the cherry species that you'll find in the grocery store, but it's edible nonetheless. Again, this is a black cherry tree or Prunus serotina. So right here, we have one of my favorite trees as of late. If you ask me, why is it one of your favorite trees? I wouldn't really have a good answer for you. I don't really know. It's just a feeling that I get whenever I find it out in the wild. This is the American hornbeam tree, or Carpinus caroliniana. It's a smaller tree in the Betulaceae family, which is the birch family. And it doesn't really grow to be too straight. So it's a smaller tree which has some bends, some twists, some kinks in it. And the bark pattern is very smooth, and it's grayish green. Now, it's got some other common names besides American hornbeam, and that's ironwood or musclewood. And they call it that for a couple of reasons. It's a very strong wood that they use to make tool handles and longbows out of. And also, it's got striations in it, kind of like the striations in muscle, kind of like it went to the gym and was pumping iron. Now, this isn't to be confused with a hop horn beam tree, which is another tree that's kind of related to this one. However, that tree's bark is much flakier and shaggier, almost like you'd want to hop off of it if you were sliding down. 
But again, this is Carpinus Carolinian of the American Hornbeam Tree. Well, hey, there you go. I hope you learned something today. You know, we probably only talked about maybe 0.01% of everything that we could ever talk about. But if you want to learn more about the flora, the fauna, and the fungi of the land that we inhabit, I encourage you to check out learnyourland.com and to join the community to stay up to date with all the information that I plan on releasing. Also, if you're watching this on YouTube, or if you're not, head on over to YouTube. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel to stay up to date with all the videos that I plan on releasing in the near future. Again, thanks so much for watching this video. Really appreciate it. Thanks for joining me on this walk. And happy Valentine's Day.